um, the way that we're going to do, uh, or the way that we're going to have like a speak and turn system is, do you all see the, uh, workshop channel under coaching discussion? You all can unmute yourself. I don't care. Yes, we do. Okay. Um, the way we're going to do things is, um, whenever anyone has a question or if they want to bring up a discussion point, you'll type one if you want to ask that in the voice chat, like unmute and say it. And you'll type two if you don't want to unmute and you just want to type the question. And then that way we're not getting spammed with questions in voice chat or in text chat, but you're still able. It's kind of just like raising your hand. Um, we'll just do that throughout this. If we get to the end and we haven't had that many questions, I'll just let you all unmute and just talk whatever the fuck. I don't care. Um, but I do hope we have a few questions because otherwise this will probably be pretty short. So we'll get started with this. Um, uh, let me pin that in the tech chat so if anyone's coming in, they can see what I mean. Okay, and pinned. Uh, pinned. Okay, so is um I have a few things that I wanted to cover in here. It's really not a lot, which is why I want you all to ask questions or bring up your own discussion points. Um, it covers right now um, mistakes that I see a lot in tier three, uh, just improving your coaching skills, different like jobs uh, or roles for coaches. That's probably the simplest thing in here. Um, things that I would recommend to all coaches and then uh just like a question section for you all to ask whatever you all want to ask i don't have like i'm not reserved about answering anything um we can start with the mistakes that i see the most um these are things that like i see that tier two teams are wanting from people um like hey we want you to do this and this and this or whatever that people aren't doing or things that people are doing that tier two teams really don't want um probably the most common one, I'll say probably because I'm not for sure, like 100% sure, is just people being way, way, way too overwordy. So what I mean is they'll take um, something simple that you could say literally just in DMs in the middle of a match to help like an individual player or just unmuting voice chat to say it to a team to just help them really quickly and they'll turn it into a fucking textbook. And I know that you all probably know some people like this or you yourself are like this or you've had like a teacher who was like this before. But this is something that I see a ton um, and it kind of screws over people because once you turn um, a coaching point that could have been five words into five paragraphs, people zone out and they stop listening and it doesn't reach them anymore. If you're sitting in a classroom and you could have a lecture in 10 minutes or you could have a lecture in three hours, which one are you going to go to? Like unless the, the three hours one is something on just is, is just on something super, super complex, like fucking astrophysics. I don't fucking know. You'd rather have that 10 minute um, lecture. At least I know I would. I don't want to sit there for three hours listening to something that I could read through a text and be done with. Um, so that's like the biggest thing I see. And that kind of leads into um a VOD reviewing style that I see a lot that I really don't like. I know um, a lot of other people don't like. I won't say this is like inherently bad, but I think most people probably won't approve of it up to the upper tiers. And that is um, more of a nitpicky style of like looking through uh, an hour or an hour and 30 minutes of a VOD and trying to look at every single mistake. Um, I feel like that just gets absolutely nothing done. It's kind of the same way as the, uh, the three hour lecture. Why would you sit through a VOD with the team and go through it for two hours when you could go through it on your own and skim it for 15 minutes and find out the same things? Um, so instead the VOD reviewing style I like to do, I'll just sum it up really quick. And then if you all want to, uh, talk about it more in depth right after, or just towards the end of this, you all can let me know. But this is the one that I got from working with Spillo uh, in Chicken Contendies. He's uh, Uprising Academy now. But it is pretty much just 10 to 30 minutes tops. You pick one or two topics and you only focus on that for the VOD. Um, and I got it down to the point or like I try to even narrow it down to the point where it's like just showing off like three or four team fights, three or four examples how to fix it, what the problem is, all that. I don't want to go through an hour and like three maps because that takes way too much time. The player 
starts to get bored, they start to zone out, they'll open up YouTube in the side, start, they'll play Minecraft, whatever the fuck they do whenever they're bored. Um, and if you're not getting bored by listening to yourself talk for an hour or two, then something's wrong there. Um, one second. Oh, um, okay. If you all want to talk about that, that VOD review style now, type A, or in the, in the workshop, don't type it yet, because we'll see, we'll get all the options out. If you want to talk about it now, you'll type A. If you want to talk about it towards the end of the VOD review, or not the VOD review, <laughs> the end of the workshop, um, type B. And if you don't want to talk about it at all, like this is basic for you, then just type C and we won't cover it. All right, Mevin, get out. I'm just kidding. That would be a good point. But am I going to do that? No. We'll we'll do that on the next poll if I if I have one. Okay, it's going to be B. Um <laughs> so we'll cover that at the end. Please remind me if I don't do it um on my own cuz I'll probably forget cuz I have the memory of a goldfish. Um, the next point in mistakes that I see happen really, really often are people being uh, almost defensive and afraid to talk and discuss more. Like they're, they're actually afraid to admit when they're wrong. I don't see it like in every single person, but I do see this common enough to make me think it's worth it to be a point. Um, you shouldn't ever be afraid for someone to say, no, I think that's wrong to you. Like and it's, it's not inherently a bad thing to be wrong. You should think of it more as an opportunity to go, okay, why am I wrong? And then you can either explain to that person why you think you're right and convince them with actual reasons. Or you can um, listen to them and have them convince you. And then even if you were wrong in that first case situation, at least now you know better. Um, what that shouldn't be whenever someone calls you out as wrong is why are you telling me that I'm wrong? You're a player. Or it shouldn't be, why are you telling me that I'm wrong? I'm the head coach. You're only the assistant coach. Or it shouldn't be, I know more than you. What do you, I, you have no idea what you're talking about. It should never be that type of situation. If you honestly believe that you're right, you should be able to explain why you're right. All of your knowledge or like all of your coaching shouldn't be based on, this is right because I said so. It should be based on, this is right because I saw it happen in all these situations and it worked out this way in these situations. And when it didn't happen, it did this instead or whatever. And like here you can look at this VOD from OWL. You can see it in play, whatever. It should always be that type of explanation. It shouldn't be, what the fuck are you talking about? Why are you questioning my authority? It should never be that aggressive. Um, I've had players talk to me, say like, I, I get what you're saying, but I think it could be like this instead and it could work out better. And I'm not going to go up to that player and go, what, what the fuck? Why are you questioning what I'm telling you? Just do what I say. I'm never going to do that. I'm going to listen to what they say and go, okay, I see what you're, where you're coming from. And either I'll agree with it and I'll change what I'm saying, or I'll go ahead and explain my, my understanding and actually back it up with facts. <laughs> okay. Okay. We're actually on top of time. Uh, this is currently mistakes commonly or actually here. I can just copy paste it from my docs. We're currently on the second point right now. Um, oh, you are going to see my notes. They're very unorganized. So yeah, I don't, I think that's another big thing. I think, and I also think talking with other coaches, um, that's a really, really good way to get a lot of perspectives and see where you disagree and why you disagree and actually see if it makes sense of what you're saying. Um, uh, two heads is always better than one. Even if you all have wildly different uh, understandings or like uh, ideas of how you would do something, what you would coach or how you would coach it. I think if both of you all can explain why you're right and then actually listen to that, it helps a ton. Because uh, like, I don't know. I don't think coaching is super concrete. It's not like you're teaching someone how to do math where there's a specific way to do every single thing every single time. And you like a hundred percent concrete know the answer. Coaching is a lot more like interpreting poems. Like there's a bunch of different ways to do it. There's a bunch of different ways that you can interpret it. And there's more than one right way of doing the coaching and actually what you are coaching. Like there's very rarely a situation where it's like a hundred percent of the time you do this and only this. 
So I think uh, just being able to admit when you're wrong and being able to listen to players and coaches is a big boon in improving your understanding. Because if the whole time you're talking fucking gibberish and it makes no sense at all and no one calls you out on it or if they do call you out on it and you ignore them, you're just going to keep talking gibberish and you're never going to get any opportunities. Because a, a higher tier team, when they see you talking gibberish, they're going to go, okay, this guy has no fucking idea what he's talking about. Get him out of here. Um, okay, third point. Uh, this is ironic because my notes are unorganized. Um, yeah, so this next point is just being unorganized uh, in general or like how how they organize their work. Um, so what I see a lot of teams do is they'll have a head coach and their assistant coaches, whether that's role coaches or whatever. We'll talk about that later. Um, and their head coach will talk to the team and their um, assistant coaches will talk to some players and then there will be no like connection between the two and there's no like um there's a, I know there's an actual word for this but I don't know what it is off the top of my head like workflow like the head coach tells the assistant coaches to do this they report back to the head coach the head coach tells the team what's happening all that all that I think there's a lot of disorganization especially in tier 3 and um, not even on just like a large scale with like the head coach talking to the assistant coaches, assistant coaches talking to the players, all that. I think there's also just a disorganization in how a, uh, coaches talk to their players. Like they'll randomly schedule shit. They'll randomly do shit. They'll randomly schedule a VOD review after not talking for three months. Not really three months, but just all this um, unorganized mess where if you were to get on consistent schedule and a consistent like flow of talking between the head coach and the players and the assistant coaches and the manager and all that it's not really like an aspect of actual coaching like it's not going to make you better at teaching your players how to do things but it makes understanding all that and doing it consistently and uh, just like being easy to work with it makes that all way 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 easier and I think that should be something that everyone should be looking to do in every type of like work, not just coaching. But I think that's something that a lot of coaches neglect. They go, Oh, I'm an assistant coach. I don't need to tell the head coach what I'm doing or work between these players or whatever. It's just, I just talk to one person at a time. And if I don't talk to a player for four weeks and so be it. And it shouldn't be like that. Um, last thing under big mistakes that I commonly see. And if you all have, uh, anything that you want to bring up, like mistakes that you think you see, don't be afraid to, do one of the uh or like raise your hand one or two for a question or just a statement i don't care i have no uh reservation um note bots i see this a lot at the lower parts of tier three or people who were at the lower parts of tier three and trying to get into the higher parts or even tier two being a note bot doesn't make you a coach i think being a coach is a lot more about how you apply what you see and like your teaching rather than just stating your teaching. So like, I understand that it's easy to get into the habit of it, especially from lower tier teams where, or even in higher tier teams, a lot of the trialing process is, okay, watch the scrim and take notes for us. And then we'll review your skill based on how you take notes. And then if you get onto the team from doing that, it's really easy to just keep doing that. And then you'll go, oh, okay, well, I've been, I took notes in the tryouts. Let me just take more notes and scrims and then I'll send the notes to the players and that'll be all I have to do. It really doesn't work like that. And that really limits how much you can do as a coach. Um, so, for example, well, well, here, I'll say this. I think your notes should always be focused on a practical um, solution to what you want to do. So I don't think your notes should ever be just, oh, th player A has this problem. It should always be player A has this problem because blah, blah, blah. They can fix it by doing this, blah, blah, blah. And I can help them by doing this, blah, blah, blah. That was what my, um, tryout notes were with Grunto Esports, which is the team that I'm with right now. And not only does that make you look better in your tryouts because the people trialing you realizes, Oh, he's not just a note, bot. he knows what he's talking about. He knows what the problem is and how to fix it. And he knows how to go out and actually do it himself. But it also keeps you into that habit of, okay, once I get onto this team, I'm taking notes, yes, but I'm actually using those notes and improving the players. Um, I was never going through and just going, this player is bad at this. It was, this player is bad at this, and then how would I go about fixing that with my help and me and him one-on-one? -on -one? Um, I think that is one of the biggest things that you can do 
in my experience, if anyone disagrees with this or has something bigger, feel free to speak up. Um, but I think this is a really huge thing that you can do to make yourself look good in the tryout process and also just work better as a coach. Um, I see a lot of people go into like theory crafting situations and that's really important in cases like shifting metas or where you just don't have like concrete evidence of like, uh, like VODs to back you up, but they get too far into theory crafting and then they spend a 30 minute VOD review session talking about a theory that's never been done before and doesn't really have a practical application when the player just wants to talk about how to fix their lamp placements. Like, I don't know, I see it way, way too much and getting into that more practical mindset can help you one with trials and two with actually coaching players. Um, go ahead, pal and talk in voice chat. Yeah, so I understand what you're saying not to do, but I'm not sure I'm not sure I understand what you're saying to do instead. Okay, so I'll give you an example. Do you think you could give like a concrete example? Yeah, 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 yeah. Let me pull up one of my notes so I can read it from you or read it to you. One second. Um Okay, so instead of taking notes with the goal of taking notes, like you don't want to be taking notes just for the goal of filling up paper. You want to be taking notes with the goal of finding a solution to whatever problem. Um, that solution can be how you would go about improving the problem, or it can be um, about what the or what the solution to the problem is and how you would. That's kind of just the same thing, but yeah, pretty much just how you would solve that problem with the help of yourself. So, um, one second, Mac. Let me finish saying this, and then I'll let you pop in. Um, so, like, for example, during this tryout, I said, blah, 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 has a hole in his hero pool because of this hero's weakness. Um, and then I talked about, like, what those weaknesses were, but I didn't stop right there. I talked about to fix those weaknesses, um, we would need to go into a VOD review, show him um, comparisons between him and Alf uh, of this character. I don't want to talk about specifics because I don't want to leak anything. Um, show him comparisons between them, talk about what they're doing and what he's not doing. Um, and then look in a VOD review and start setting goals for him to start filling in those mechanical holes. Um, and that's just in my trial notes. That's without even actually touching the player. So do you see how the difference is between saying, um, these are his problems and these are his problems and I'm going to fix them by doing it this way. And then when you're actually on the team, then you have to actually follow through and actually do that preparation of then watching through VODs. Uh, yeah, Jumper, that's a good way to put it. Watching the VODs, getting into VOD reviews, all that. Okay, go ahead and go, Mac. Uh, I wanted to hear your opinion on both, like, Tier 2, Tier 3 differences as well as region-based. Because what I, I've noticed is that um, if you look at Tier 3, I noticed that a lot of teams are focused on their coach knowing as much as possible and having really strong theory. When oftentimes I feel like that doesn't translate to being able to win games. I think what, as you mentioned, the reality is you need to be really practical. And I've also seen this, and this is just more general. I've seen the differences that in NA teams, for example, are really more focused on practical gameplay and focusing on very like uh, things that you can change. Whereas there's a lot more theory based going on in EU. And I, I want to see your opinion on that. Um, I actually have that at the end of my notes about things that I would bring up. Um, but I guess we can talk about it here because that's kind of more spef uh, specific than what I, what I was going to talk about. So you said um, the differences between Tier 2 and Tier 3, like theoretical versus practical? Question mark. Yeah, I think you said that. Okay. Um, I do I do agree. I do see that. Um, actually, we had, when I was running a, a startup project, extremely scuffed that was guaranteed to die from the start, and it did die. But what we were looking for uh, in head coaches and what I saw between other teams looking for in head coaches was a lot of teams were looking for head coaches with a ton of experience and people who would 100% do the macro or whatever. And then what we got recommendation-wise from other uh, like Tier 2 coaches were literally them saying, hey, you don't need to look for a head coach who's going to spend all his time on theory crafting. You don't even need a true head coach role. All you need is someone who can come in and be like an authority figure and lead the team. And then you can have even like an assistant coach work on the macro or whatever. So that's more so less about theory crafting and more about practically leading the team down to solutions. Um, and I see what you mean by, by the, uh, there. And I do definitely agree with um, tier three teams focusing too much on the theory crafting part. 
rather than looking about or looking how like small changes actually affect their gameplay. Um, and I think that's kind of one of the things holding back a lot of people who get started in tier three from going to tier two. They get too used to that tier three mindset of how do I talk about this in a vacuum and make it work in a vacuum? Whereas a lot of tier two teams are like, okay, how do we make this work in the game? What are the effects of this in the game? Um, I can't speak specifically for NA versus EU because EU time zones make me die. So I've almost never touched EU. Um, but I can definitely say that I do see that difference between tier three and tier two, um, on air at, in, in a tier three. Um, fuck, I forgot what I was going to say. Mac, if you have anything else, you can bring it up. Yeah, I, I was going to type it, but I, I kind of want to point out and also see your opinion that I feel like a lot of um, Tier 3 coaches have it actually a lot harder in some ways than Tier 2 because I think that the requirements for traveling is often really ludicrous, such as, you know, you have to have a minimum rank of GM or you need to have 1,000-hour experience in a... Uh, in coaching or all sorts of, you know, like ideas about a coach that's really incorrect. Whereas I feel like in tier two, it's more kind of more accurate. So I, I think that for, t for tier three coaches, they're looking to get into the scene. You have to realize that the, the trialing process is completely different from what you'd expect to be reasonable and you have to adapt to that. So like, I don't know if you think that's the same or if you think there's more like flow than more flattened out in terms of the trialing process. Yeah, I mean, I I agree. I think I think any tier three team that is setting um, requirements like that should be avoided like the fucking plague, um, because they're almost always guaranteed to be bad. Because the only people who set requirements like that are people who aren't experienced at that level. Like um, when I was trialing with Chicken Contendies, uh, they were still in OD. They weren't in Contenders yet. I had the bare minimum tier three experience. I a low tier three team at best was the last team that I was on. Um, but I showed up in trials. They didn't ask for requirements of like, okay, how many hours do you have? They didn't ask for requirements of like, you need to be a certain rank. They were just like, okay, show us why you can be a coach. They didn't literally say that. Obviously it was a trialing process, but that was pretty much what they were looking for. I think those obviously, I got kind of lucky to get on to from a low tier three team to a team that rode from OD to contend or to contenders. Um, but those are the type of teams that you should be looking for, not teams that set requirements on you. And I think when you are trialing for tier two teams, you should always be trying to make the tryout as much of a display of your actual skill and process as you can. So like, that's what I meant by I put practical solutions in all of my notes um, cause I know whenever I'm actually coaching, I almost always stray away from just pure theory crafting. I always try to make it super practical. It's kind of why I have short VOD reviews too. It's kind of just bite-sized and super digestible. Um, so I think trying to show your, the team that you're trialing for what you actually do, even under their like tryout system is the best that you can do. It's like, if they want you to be a head coach and just sit silent and take notes, don't just sit silent and take notes in the notes, make them, um, how did jumper put it? Oh, I think he deleted it. God damn it. Uh, make the notes, um, actionable. Yeah. Actionable too. Um, all right, we're going to move on to the next part. Uh, do you all want me to cover like just how to improve your coaching skills? Cause anyone with tier three experience should like be past this part already. Um, okay. Jumper. I didn't say anything about letters, so I don't know when you're on um, here. Uh, want me to God damn it. Cover how to improve coaching skill. React with a for yes. B with no. He said react. He never said where to react. I'm going to lose my mind. <laughs> All right, we'll cover it then. Um, I think this is super simple, so I'm going to try and ble please, breeze through it um, as fast as possible because I know there's definitely people who don't need to hear this in the group ch or in the, the voice chat right now. Um, the way that I do it, and if anyone else has any other ways, don't be afraid to chime in. Um, but the way that I do it is... I start with watching um, anything upper level that I can get my hands on, whether that's OWL, good contenders teams, uh, good tier three teams in tournaments, um, watching other coaches analysis, whatever. I will watch that as much as I can, but I'm not watching it just for the sake of watching it. I'm watching it for the sake of seeing what's happening in the VOD. 
why it's happening and how it's happening. So what I see a lot of the times is coaches will go in, see something happening in Owl, and then they'll go, okay, now let's do it in Tier 3. And they have no fucking clue why it's happening in Owl. So they don't know how to properly do it. This happened a ton in GOATS meta. Um... In tier 3 and tier 2, uh, while there were teams playing quad DPS and they would just force it on any map that they could, even on maps where it just didn't make sense and they didn't really know how to play it, they just saw that teams were playing it and they'd go, well, this really good Korean contenders team is doing or this really good uh, owl team is doing, so let's do it too. Um, and they don't really break down why they're doing it and, uh, how, like what the process is, what angles are we taking, what's our win conditions, all that. They just see that it's happening and then they go and put it in for themselves. I think the biggest thing per for improving your understanding and your, um, ability to actually implement it is not just looking at what is happening, but why and how, um, that kind of covers that next part. Um. And then this kind of goes back to not being afraid to admit when you're wrong, but I said just also talking to players and other coaches about their understanding and your understanding, comparing everything and explaining your reasoning on everything. I don't want it, or it shouldn't just be, okay, this is what I saw, this is right, nothing else to talk about. It should be, what did you see, why is it happening, how is it happening, also how can you implement it on your own, because sometimes you don't have to do everything beat for beat, you can take uh, parts of it. Um, and then breaking that down, if you have internal coaches, like if you all have, uh, other coaching staff, you all can just talk to them. If you all are on servers with other coaches like this one, or, um, the overwatch staff central, you can talk there, whatever. Or if you just have friends who are on other teams, go ahead. It doesn't matter. Um, okay. We'll answer some questions then. I want to submit a question. How much do you think luck factors into climbing? Um, climbing in the like a staff ladder yeah not like competitive rank okay i was gonna say <laughs> um i don't know so much about luck well okay so here's what i think it is i think luck can help you get your foot into the door but i don't think luck should will almost ever get you to a proper tier so like getting yourself um, randomly seen through an application sure that can help you get actually trialed but even if you're lucky and get trialed if you're a dog shit coach you're not going to get that spot um i think there's some things that you can do outside of just being a good coach to help you get your foot in the door for trials um having really good resumes like just teams that you've been on obviously helps if you've been on four contenders teams um, and they've done decently, you're probably going to get on a fifth one. Um, things like streaming, getting your uh, content out there into the world. Jane, Natter, um, Spillo, Mineral, all these coaches, even if that's not their main thing, having your content out there and getting recognized helps you get tryouts, even if it doesn't help you secure uh, roster slots. Um, that's a whole different discussion. But that does help you get your foot in the door. I think luck can help. Like, I think it was a little bit lucky for me to get a tryout for CC after seeing it in a Discord while having the minimal experience. But luck didn't get me on that team. It was me actually trying out that got me on that team, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, Delta put it good. Good. <laughs> um, what is your opinion on player-led teams? Of course, niche, but curious. I very much do not like player-led teams uh, because of my experience with them. I don't think that players having input is bad, and I don't think that players being able to have some effect is bad. But I think the second that you let players start dedicating or dictating roster decisions or really, really big things uh, continuously is the second that that team will start to go downhill. Um, I won't get into anecdotes because some of that stuff is very, very private, but... Like, I don't think, I, I don't think it's bad to ask your, like, in a tryout, ask your players, hey, how did you all feel about this guy? Or ask your players uh, in a comp, hey, how did you all feel about this comp or this hero or whatever? But the second where you let one player go, no, I don't like this dude, get him out or I'm gonna go. Or if you have one player go, dude, I fucking hate this comp, I cannot stand playing Hanzo, put me on McCree or I'm done. At that moment, no more player control roster. You need to step in and take control of that situation. I think that happens a lot more in Tier 3 than it does in Tier 2. But there are some instances of very good player-run rosters getting into Tier 2 and then kind of devolving because player-run uh, relations can only hold for so long. Like, when you're 
when you're on a team with someone, you can not like them, but still work well with them. But when you don't like them and suddenly you can also make roster decisions, you're setting yourself up for disaster because then it will go from not liking them, but working well with them to not liking them and forcing them off the team no matter what. Um, and that's a situation that you want to be avoiding. Um, all right, we'll do these last two questions from uh, X Quincy and Doom Bros, and then we'll get back onto this, and we'll host questions later. Can we make our tier three players more dedicated? Um, I think you can. I think tier three, you definitely can. Tier four or like casual teams, I don't really know if you can, um, because there has to be some amount of uh drive behind it there has to be some sort of desire behind it um and tier three players are in tier three not be just not just because they're good at the game because there's ladder players who've never touched tier three and will just keep on having fun um in ladder or dominating ladder or whatever and they won't touch teams unless they just get like a tier two offer out of nowhere um but when you're in tier three, you're in there because you want to be in the team environment and you want, you have aspirations of getting to tier two or collegiate or wherever you want to go. Tier two, OWL, academy, collegiate, whatever other opportunities you want to have. I've yet to meet a tier three player who is, um, I mean, yeah, Mac, there are cases of it doing well. I just personally don't like it. Um, I've yet to see a tier three player get onto a team just for the sake of being on a team for literally no fucking reason other than being on a team usually it's because they have goals they want to meet or things they want to accomplish whatever and i think if they do have that then you can push them to being more dedicated um you can go okay i understand that you don't like orissa but how are you ever going to get on a tier two team when you just won't play certain heroes because they'll just pick someone else up who is just who is good on those heroes and is willing to actually play them and if that doesn't start um kickstarting them into actually trying even if they don't specifically enjoy that role it's either um a mentality issue where they just need to like take a break like the game is draining them it has way too much strain on them because they should be able to do things that they don't like for the sake of their career um or they shouldn't be on your team um, and that sounds kind of extreme, but if you have a player who is hurting your team by being completely unwilling to do, uh, by play, by, ah, for playing certain heroes, there's almost always going to be more fish in the sea. There's almost always going to be, um, more players to choose from. And even if they're, even if you feel like that player is really, really good and finding another player just as good as them is hard, would you rather have a player who is decent but actually willing to play and work together and learn and get better or have a good player who is just not doing anything i think the answer to that is pretty simple um all right doom bros that's one is there any instances where a coach would actually be hurtful for a team uh absolutely positively um well i think it depends do you mean a coach is hurtful as in just having any coach is bad for the team or where a specific coach or like doing a specific thing as a coach can be hurtful for the team? Can you um iterate on that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I can talk. Yeah, so uh, with some teams, uh, in my experience, we have like a general, uh, we have a hard time uh, bringing in a coach because we have a hard time respecting people who hasn't achieved uh, what they have, right? Let's say you're maybe an XL player or tier two player or whatever. Uh, sometimes I feel like people can have a hard time being told what to improve on, uh, and maybe it's, you can be the best co coach ever. But like some teams, pro like have a general like distaste for a coach, maybe because they had a bad coach in the like from a past team or whatever. So like, uh, yeah, my, my question is, have you had like experience with like teams being really stubborn about coaching, you know, and doesn't want to let anyone tell them what to do, you know? Yeah, I've definitely had experiences like that and heard of experiences like that. I think, oh, sorry, one second, let me mute for a second. All right, Um, I think it is... Not necessarily bad to have it. I'm going to sound really awful because there's a garage door right under my room. I don't think it's necessarily bad to have that kind of um, like question for respect when you first join the team. Like if there's a brand new coach, um, even if they have experience, like I've seen this on teams before where they have experience, it might take some time for the players to go, you know what, I completely agree or just like start 
or just not question them with every single thing that they say. I don't think that's inherently bad because I think you can earn their respect if you prove that you're a good coach and explain your reasoning for everything. And this kind of goes back to that. Don't be afraid to um, be told or don't be afraid to admit when you're wrong or just even when someone disagrees with you. Sometimes you'll have to prove why you're right uh, or at least prove as much as you can. And sometimes you'll have to work with people to get them to start to respect you. But I don't think that's inherently bad. I think it's bad when they just won't no matter what. If they will not respect you no matter what, like no long, no matter how much you reason with them or how much you explain your reasoning or how long you've been with them or whatever because of um, like your... Uh, your experience, like if you don't have tier two experience and you're working with ex tier two players and they just refuse to listen to you uh, for that, no matter what, no matter how good of a coach you are, then you don't need to be on that team because that team is not going to get you anywhere. But if it's just someone where it's like they're ex tier two and you have no tier two experience and they'll maybe question you a little bit at first, but then they'll, if you can explain your reasoning well and um, not just take random gibberish takes and listen to their reasoning as well and kind of um give and take some and prove why you deserve your respect um then i think that's not bad to hear at all like uh i don't know i hear a lot um respect your elders and then i also which is where you think you deserve respect no matter what and then i hear a lot um respect is earned not uh given or whatever the saying is that's kind of like i don't mind having that on a team and i've had teams with players before where i go with them and we talk for a few times on the first few times they're just disagreeing with everything i say no matter how much i explain and that's fine i'm not going to give up that easy but if uh because usually they'll break down after like two weeks at most and start listening to what i'm saying um so i think that's just i think that's important to differentiate and if you see a team where that's just going on you should get out of there um, all right, fuck it. I kind of like answering the questions. We'll keep answering questions. <laughs> um, yeah, Exquency, I would, uh, I would boot him. If, even if he's the captain, well, okay, so if he's the captain and you're not able to get him to be more dedicated by telling him, um, about his goals and like how, what he needs to do to reach those goals, then I would give him the boot. If he's just being stubborn, but he's like, damn, you're right. I do need to do this to get better. I do need to do this to reach my goals. Then you can kind of reach through to him. But if he's just being stubborn, he, like, he has no reason to be in Tier 3, then he has no reason to be in your team. Um, Fox, I will get to that because I do actually have that question uh, towards the end of my uh, script, quote-unquote. Do you all want me to cover... Um, this is another simple one uh, that I don't know if you all will need me to cover. Um, second, let me type it out. Uh, react A if you want me to cover the different coaching roles or jobs. B if you don't. I wouldn't be surprised if you all don't want me to. We can. We don't have to cover this if you all don't need it. If we do vote to cover it, I'll do it at the very, very end so that anyone who doesn't want to listen doesn't have to. They can just go. But I don't. Th I don't. Mm. Yeah, I don't think we need to cover it, especially since there's a list out there. All right. Things I would recommend to all coaches. This is the. Uh, this is the last thing. Um, a lot of this is very much tied to mistakes that I see a lot. So things like get organized, obviously I would recommend that to people because a mistake I see is people being unorganized. Um, but there are some things here that I didn't mention, like making sure you're involved, time management and confidence, but not cocky. Um, and we'll cover those real quick. Um, well, I guess being involved with the team is kind of similar to, uh, being a note bot, but I see this a lot with players who don't have the experience of the play or not players who have the experience coaches who don't have the same experience as the players that they're coaching or coaches who are getting or are kind of new into tier three in general. If you're a tier four coach going into tier three for the first time, it can be intimidating. Same thing with tier three going into tier two. And it can be really, really easy to just take notes and not talk to players and barely interact with players and all that. That's not going to help you be a better coach and it's not going to help the players. And I understand some people are introverts, um, and I understand some people are just afraid of being told, no, you're wrong, or whatever. But um, 
Agreed, Mac. Agreed. Um, we can go into that later if you want. Um, but I think the biggest thing that you can do to help your confidence, your experience, and your players is to just get involved, even if you have to like force yourself to do it. Um, talk to players before scrims, um, whether it's prepping for the scrim, reviewing a scrim, or just talking to them like friends, make connections. Uh, you don't want to be their best friend, obviously. You're still kind of an authority figure, but actually talk to them. Like, Make sure they don't go, wait, what the fuck? We have an assistant coach. I didn't even realize that. He never talks to me. Um, but like, you should always be... Chaos. <laughs> God damn it. Um, you should be getting involved with that, and especially with VOD reviews. You should never be afraid to be scheduling VOD reviews. That should be what you're... Like, you shouldn't be doing three of them a day, obviously. Um, but you should definitely be getting involved with that. And that, if I'm going to be honest, that is my absolute biggest regret from being in Tier 2. I was way too afraid. I was way, way too afraid to just get involved with players... Um, uh, kind of on just an interaction friendly level and also just in a VOD reviewing level. I should have been reviewing way more. I should have been um, talking to just players even outside of scrims way more. That's something that I see with people who are afraid to get into the tier that they're in because of low experience. Well, once you overcome that hurdle, coaching just becomes so much easier. Um, time management. This is an obvious one. Kind of relates to getting organized. Like It's not something specifically that you need to be a coach, but it's something that everyone should have. If you're a head coach, you're sitting in scrims for four hours a day. If you're an assistant coach, you're sitting in, uh, depending on which role, you're probably sitting in most scrims, all of them, or just like some of them, whatever, you know, how not all assistant coaches are required for every single scrim, but either way, you're dedicating a lot of time per day. On top of VOD reviews, watching other VODs so you can um, plan and all that, just all that stuff. It's going to take a lot of time. So if you're lazy and procrastinate a ton, you're either not going to do everything that you need to do, like studying VODs to get better uh, at coaching, or you're going to start skipping out on scrims or start skipping out on VOD reviewing with players, whatever. You need to set, like, just get organized and manage your time well. Make a schedule if you need to. Um, last one, and then we'll do some more questions. Be confident, not cocky. This kind of goes back to getting involved. Don't be afraid to say what you have. Don't let a player bully you into, um, especially if you're newer onto the team or newer into the scene, don't let a team bully, or a team, don't let a player bully you into uh, backing off on your coaching. Be confident in what you're saying because you're able to back it up with reasons. Don't um, just go, well, I think this is good, I don't know, um, and then let them bully you out of it. But don't be cocky with it either. That's kind of goes. That kind of goes back to don't be afraid to admit when you're wrong. Don't go. No, this is right every time because I said it. Uh, we don't need to iterate on that anymore. I think we've talked about it for like 55 minutes. Um. All right, we'll answer some questions now. Um. All right, Blue Fan. What's the best way to increase consistency and comps for players who are very discouraged by their own gameplay or team play? It's very hard to do, um, because you can't control the player's voice box you can't uh physically make them talk on on your own you can't fucking i'm not gonna say that that sounds disgusting but you can't control them like a puppet and make them talk whenever you want the best thing that you can do from my experience is to get them to start talking in scrims progressively more and more and more um if you need to ask them to turn up their comps because they're quiet whatever that's fine but just i don't know introverts you can get introverts to talk more once they get used to talking and once they start building friendships with players you can get people who are frustrated to start talking more by talking about their frustrations to you and settling those frustrations and then just getting them used to the environment it's not easy and it's never going to be as quick or as easy as going hey can you talk more it's going to be something that you would kind of have to hound them on and side note this shouldn't be the only thing that you coach them i see way too many coaches getting into teaching the team the comm structure for four months. Um, but it is something that you will kind of have to hound them on consistently. Um, whether you need to DM them mid-scrim, go, remember to keep talking. If that's something you need to do, just stay on their ass about it. Um, how would... how would uh, Nice grammar, Zandy. How would go about a coach that doesn't respect the team manager and doesn't work with them? Um, drop them. <laughs> I, I, can't, I honestly can't think of anything more... Other than that, so 
if it's not like a player situation, you can get a player to respect you by explaining everything. If you've explained everything um, as like a manager or whatever, and they just literally won't respect you because they're just a disrespectful person. If they won't respect you or won't respect the players or just don't respect you, how are they going to respect anything on that team? I, I think respect is really important and I think it's fair for it to be earned. Yeah, let's <laughs> chill out a little. Um, I think it's fair for respect to be earned, but if you've gone through the process of trying to earn that respect and they're still just disrespect, disrespectful, and I think there's a difference between not giving respect and being disrespectful, if that makes sense. Oh, Aplox, did you have a question? If you did retype it, please, because I didn't see it. Uh, no, no, I'm good. I'm good, thanks. Okay. Um, I think there's a difference between um, giving respect and being disrespectful. Like, I cannot give my respect to you, but still not say something rude. Um, I'll just like question you a little bit, but there's, I can also just be an absolute cunt and be disrespectful. I think if they're ever disrespectful, you need to bring that into question and talk about it. And if it's something that reoccurs, give them the boots. They don't need to be there. There's, uh, even if you have to bring in coaches with less experience, there's always going to be more coaches desperate for any position. Um, and if that's a coach who is way more willing to actually work with you and improve things, I'd way rather have that than someone who is more knowledgeable, but just an absolute cunt. And sorry for my French, but you know how it is. Um, sorry, I got a name. I got to look through questions. Okay. Um, the reason why I say coaches should start at 4.4K. I started in platinum. <laughs> I started with, no, yes. I started with a platinum team as an assistant coach. Then went to a platinum team as a head coach. And then from there, I went straight to a 4.4K team. Um, while that platinum team did build me some amazing connections, like I met Yokai on the very first team I was on. I met Cebu Cebu on the very first team I was on, which he is now a contenders analyst. Um, so I met all those people from a plat team. Building that connection is good, but you don't need that to teach you how to do coaching. In fact, I learned how to be a better coach way more from that 4.4 K team and talking to coaches than I did from, um, being on that plat team. And you can get onto a 4.4 K team that isn't top OD with super high standards. Um, like for example, that team that I went from that lower tier three team to chicken contendies, which was a really high tier three team at the time they went undefeated through OD. Um, they weren't super, super competitive, and I went to them from a plat team. I was able to go through them because I wasn't just, like, hopping right fresh out the boat. Like, I, I don't think you should go from absolutely no knowledge at all to 4.4K team. I think you should learn, um, like, the basics, like, kind of just going over things through this. Like, you how to talk to coaches, how to talk to players, how to learn, improve your knowledge, all of that. I think you should do that before joining any team. Um, but then I think what you've got that you've got the basics for what you need to join a 4.4 K team. Um, I think a lot of coaches get scared and they go, these players are like pretty high GM. What if I don't know how to fix whatever mistakes they have? I think if you one, I think there are some players who even at 4.6, well, you will just see the dumbest fucking mistakes from them. And it will be like fixing a silver player's mistakes. You won't have to worry about that. But I think even if there are players where you're not sure what you do need to be fixing, that's where watching those high-level VODs and comparing it to their gameplay and seeing what they're doing and why and how and comparing it to your players, that'll like just start bringing in more and more things that you need to do to go, oh, okay, this is what this player is doing at a really, really owl high owl level. This is what my player isn't doing. Um, why is it working for them? Why isn't it working for my player? How can I teach them all that? Um, so that's why I think you can kind of start at 4.3 or 4.4. Um, or at least if you're going to work at a team lower than that at least do it for kind of like a short-term thing um you don't need to be with that team for four months before you go into gm because gm players are really not that good i promise you all they're uh they're kind of they're kind of papega sometimes um even in tier two you'll see some goofy shit so don't worry so much about i don't know what i'm doing um, because you can learn that. And especially if you're on a team that isn't top tier three, you'll have time to learn that, um, because they're not expecting an owl coach to be hopping in and coaching them. Um, so that's why I say you should start at 4.4, just because I think a lot of teams below that won't give you the challenge that you need to improve. 
um, or I think at least if you are going to join a team below that, you don't need to start with a platinum team and then go to a diamond team and then go to a master's team and then go to a GM team. You don't need to do all that. Like I went from platinum to GM and the GM team was just as bad as the platinum team. So you don't have to spend a year getting into all these basic things when you could try really, really hard outside of just the team and then get to that team and do well. Um... Do we have any questions? One, if you want to ask it in voice chat. Two, if you want to ask it in um, the text chat. We'll clean this up a little bit. I see people typing, but I see no ones or twos. Yeah, I'm calling you all out. Go ahead, Carol. How do you combat players tilting not necessarily their team but more their self and their own mistakes? Um, I do have players who are like this. I think a lot of time that comes from them wanting to be as good as they can possibly be. That's not a bad thing. Um, it turns bad when they start to tilt because of it, and then that starts to affect their gameplay. So I think there's a few things you can do. Uh, talk to the just talk to them. Talk to them about how. I understand it's super it's it's a good thing it's a good thing to okay equity that doesn't make sense um it's a good thing to be hard on yourself and want to improve and want to do everything you can to improve but talk to them about how it's not healthy to get so hard that you start to get mad because that's only going to worsen your gameplay like if in the end if um their their goal or why they're getting so mad is because they want to get better you can explain to them I understand you want to get better, but getting mad at yourself is only going to make you get worse, not better. Um, save that frustration for when you're looking through the VOD so that you can look through things to fix, not when you're actually playing the scrim and hurting your results. Um, sometimes it'll come from things in their real life that you can't fix. Like uh, maybe they have um, their mental is boomed just from things in real life. They have real life uh, family issues, friend issues, whatever. You can't always fix that. Um, and I don't think you should always be responsible for fixing that. Like, you don't have... Like, uh, this sounds really bad to say, but if a player has depression, you're not a paid professional. Did I say... I said if they had depression, right? I feel like I just stumbled over my words. You said it fine. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, if they have depression, you're not a paid professional. You don't know how to fix that already. Um, the most you can do is try to make scrims, the environment for scrims, as easy for them as possible. Talk to them as much as you can, like... You don't need to be beating yourself down because it's not making you any better. Um, and there's not and like there's not much you can do in the way of actually removing stressors for them unless it's from the team environments. The best you can do is just talk to them about it and kind of be a vent for them. I know I've had players before where I'm like, okay, don't get mad in the scrim at your teammates or at yourself. Vent to me in DMs. We can talk about it mid scrim or after the scrim or whatever. And then that way, uh, sometimes they should need someone to talk to, and that helps. Um, Jumper, go ahead and type your question, and then X Quincy, you can ask yours in VC. Um, here, we'll answer some of these while uh, we wait. Uh, how do you fix people who won't stop tunnel visioning? I coach 4K teams and have at least three players across the rosters who refuse to open up their minds to stop tunnel visioning. Um, get the VOD of the scrim and just highlight instances where they start tunnel vision just like <laughs> open up the vod share screen epic pin show how their tunnel visioning gets them killed repeatedly like just circle it watch uh, run where they are uh, draw where they're running to and how they're missing everything going on around them and explain to them how hard that is fucking them and if you do this like two times and it just doesn't get through their head uh, join a higher tier team. <laughs> like, <clears throat> I would say get better players, but when you're coaching a 4K team, this is kind of like the problem that I meant, uh, or one of the problems with like coaching a sub 4.4K 4, 4. 4 team for like your first times. You don't, you're not really replacing players at a tier like that. I mean, I guess you can, but there's not so much as a drive at that level of get better or we'll bench you or we'll replace you or whatever. Um, because even at 4K, they're not really striving for a pro play. Unless it's people who are just getting into it. So just show them instances of it happening to them and how it's hurting them. And 
that should and I don't know, like there's nothing you can coach them about how to get better at opening their eyeballs. There's nothing you can coach them about how to stop staring into a wall or looking at the ground. Um, you just kind of have to show them what is happening and how the what the bad effects are, and then hope that they'll start opening their eyeballs. Like there, those are one of the mistakes that you won't really see so hard at the upper tiers, where players have just gotten used to the basic things that they need to be doing. Excellency, if you still have a, a question, don't be afraid to ask in voice chat. Okay, thanks. Um, I will give you an example case. Like, we are a 4.4, 4.5k average team, and we have a player, he has picked like 4.6. And it is high, like all of the members, and that brings him an ego. So I have struggled with managing his ego in the past. He's like, he, if a tier 2 team want to have him tomorrow, he will just immediately leave us. So he doesn't bring a cool separate inside a team. But he's also one of the coolest players. So we don't want to kick him because he's actually playing well. But I wasn't able to explain why he should keep grinding instead of like waiting for an offer from a tier 2 team. I told him, like I because I only know the coaching numbers, I know only three people got into like tier two scene from tier three. This like last open division, I guess. Only three people. We got like hundreds of people here, and only three people got into tier two from tier three. So like, I can't really make my players see these numbers more than tier two, three. Quite told me that was three. Whatever. So like, my question is, how do we see? Like, or, like, make them see these numbers. Because you have to grind. You can't do much, anything about it. But they are, like, waiting for an offer. Maybe they are just lazy, but... Yeah, that, that's my question. Um, so, if it's because of his peak specifically, you can talk to him about some of the absolute shitters who gets really high peaks. Um, or the one tricks, or just anyone in general. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And then you can also talk about how there are just as many or like there's tons of players who are just as good as him um who don't have that ego issue and they will 100 percent of the time be picked before he is even if he's a good player that people will just overlook him because of shit like that and you have to explain to him that that's gonna happen um you and you can tell him like dude you're a good player i get that but your ego is just as much as uh has just as much of an impact as your uh actual gameplay like your ability to stay in the team environment has a, a huge impact too um and if he still doesn't understand that and he's still refusing to listen to any of that um boot him i like just like uh, max said uh, give him the boots there's always going to be more people who are willing to fill his side and like yeah he's good and i get that he's good but if he's a good player but he's ruining the team environment and he's not getting better better players are going to come along anyway <coughs> Um, there's no reason to keep him around if he's not getting better and even if he's uh, hurting your team by being egotistical. And I understand that's going to hurt in the short term to be like, damn, we lost a really good player. But I, don't know, I feel like that team situation is only going to get worse if you, te- if you keep around a really, really egotistical player who just refuses to listen to reasoning. <clears throat> so I would say try and try and explain to him how that ego is not... He's not going to get on a Tier 2 team with that type of ego. Um, or even if he does get on a Tier 2 team... After those tier two players hear his ego, um, his rut will spread and he'll never get on another one. <coughs> um, finish. You can ask your question in voice. Okay, so I coach for a collegiate team, um, and they're like mid plat, high di- or low diamond, high gold kind of range, and we have two players specifically that are like part of this issue. But I was wondering if you had any advice for dealing with people who really don't listen to feedback and criticism well. Because me and along with a lot of other people on the team up from them in the same uh, collegiate like group, um, we've tried helping them out and giving them feedback. And they just don't like to listen to our advice at all. And I was wondering if you had just any like tips or anything that would offer any help for that. I would start with showing them all their mistakes and how it's impacting their game. Because if you can honestly want to be on the team 
and sit through someone showing you everything you're doing wrong and how it's getting you killed and your teammates killed over and over and over and over and you can sit through that and go, I don't care, then you don't need to be on the team. Um, even if it's just like for fun or whatever, if it's for fun, then they should be willing to listen to some to some things. If it's competitive, then they should be willing to listen to some things. Um, like if it's for fun and you have your friend telling you, hey, <clears throat> can we try this? And you just go, no, fuck you. You don't need to be on that team even if it's just for fun. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, Mac it is. Um, so I would start by showing all of his or all of their uh, failures and how, how it's actually impacting them. Just go, look here, you missed the shot. Sh throw, go through and look at like major instances, major patterns. Go, look, this is what hap is happening. Every single time it's happening, you're dying and we're losing the team fight because of you. Um, and then from that, I would go and make sure you have strong reasoning behind all of your uh advice that you're trying to give don't just try and give advice for the sake of giving advice make sure when you give advice you're really able to back it up with um high tier vod uh as like evidence like see they do this here and it works like this and this happens and whatever um fuck and what else was i gonna say and then just like explain how it impacts everything and if all that all that happens and none of it improves just give them the boots like they they have no ob or they have no um What's the word? Like, it, they don't have to be on that team. Even if it's for their college, like, they don't have a right to be on that team. It's a privilege to be on that team. It's an optional thing. Um, yeah, that's what I was trying to say. So, if they're seriously going to keep doing that over and over and they just won't stop, give them the boots. Like, ultimately, the staff has control over that. Even if it's just a team that is not super competitive. Dutch, go ahead, and then we'll get back on to more questions. I have to unmute myself before I can start talking. Forehead, um, <laughs> forehead. Uh, in first case, before so b because I have to start finding a 4.4k team, but like, the, and this is something I see a lot uh, of coaches do in the in the lower tiers, is, and this is maybe some something that's happening for you. That's why I wanted to add it is that a lot of coaches are like explaining stuff which is relevant for GM players instead of relevant to the level that they're trying to coach in. But as you were describing and and someone else just was Evie was just pointing out like they really need to or they don't don't have to but they need to be open for coaching in the first place, like... Achtman, I have issue. Say it again? I have been a... Oh. Oh, your mic is just Yeah, open. he's just unmuted. Go ahead. <laughs> just talking um, to himself. But, but, worry, the, but the thing is, one, you cannot help people that don't want to listen, and two, like, what I see quite often in lower tiers is that the coaching or that that advice is not relevant for the level where they're uh, where they're at at that at that moment. So, for example, you can, and this is a throw a book method that I explain to a lot of people. Like you can, for example, you can explain goats for like two hours, but if they don't know the basic fundamentals of the game, then there's no point in going and tell them a two hour speech about goats if they don't even know how to play the heroes correctly in the first place. Okay, um, and then we will, okay, I'll finish going through these questions. I'm gonna try and speed through some of these because there is a bit of a backlog. Jumper, sorry, I didn't see your question before. Um, opinion on coach not being only an owl coach leader, but also a mentor helped to improve as a person beyond OW. Um, I think it should to an extent, like I don't think you should be doing their homework for them or trying to do jobs that you just physically can't do. Like I talked about earlier, you're not a, a paid professional therapist, but um, you there are some things that you can help them with outside of the game that will help them with the game, but also just help them as a person. So like, for example, I've had to make sure before that my players in the past were going to sleep at normal times. They were eating the right foods. They were stretching. They weren't just sitting in their chair all day. And like, yeah, those things have an impact in the game too, but it also just helps them being better people. So like if you've got someone who's really toxic, if you can help them 
stop being toxic in the game, that's probably going to help them stop being toxic in real life. Um, or just, like, making sure that they start caring for themselves. Because I had, like, for example, in our second block, we were dying out, complete low energy. Um, so I had to get players to start eating right and start sleeping right. And, yeah, that helped them in the game, but it also just helped them throughout their normal, uh, everyday lives. Um, what programs do you suge suggest a VOD review with? Um... I don't really use programs. What I, the way that I find it is the easiest um, because I like to do them very, very fast. Like I said, 10 to 30 minutes. Also remind me to talk about that um, towards the end. Um, I'll get the VOD that I want to look at. I'll Discord share screen and I'll use Epic Pin to draw on the VOD and I'll show whatever I want to show, go through everything, um, and I'll be done with it. Um, I know there are some good... Uh, Applications, sorry, I couldn't think of the word. Um, I just don't personally use any. I do use things like, yeah, I was gonna say insights.gg. Uh, I do use things like stat banana if I want to show like maps without like an actual VOD, just all those types of things. Um, <clears throat> I will 100% recommend Epic Pen. You can get it for free and it's amazing for VOD reviewing. Um, do you think there's a need room for mentality coaching in tier three? <coughs> I don't think there's a need for it as a specific role um i think if you need to fix someone's mentality that's something that like your head coach or an assistant coach could work on to an extent like i said you're not a paid uh you're not a professional therapist but i don't think there's some like unless you literally have someone who is a paid professional in real life who is able to do these things um for your team then i don't think there's really a need for it as a specific role um, I think if there's someone who is just consistently bad about their mentality and it won't improve no matter what you all do and you all don't have a paid professional, then they need to go. Um, I think having like being able to work on people's mentality to an extent as like part of the side is good, but I've very rarely seen a coach who is uh, specifically mentality. Um, Zeus, I kind of covered that stat banana epic pin, sometimes insights. Um, uh, do you prefer watching VODs or replays? I prefer VODs. I don't know. There's just something about replays that I really don't like. So I prefer the player to get the VOD if they can. Obviously, I don't care if the player like, um, gets like goes into first person of the replay and records it on their own and then sends it to me just like it was a normal VOD. But I don't really like having, um, like, just the player go, okay, let's review this replay, and then they just bring it up. Um, because it, it kind of, I don't know, I just feel like it takes control out of my hands for being able to review what I want to review. Whenever I'm doing VOD reviews, I've already gone over the whole, or, like, skimmed through the VOD, looked through the VOD, looked at what I want to talk about on my own um, beforehand, and I've planned everything out. Whereas as soon as we get a replay, the player is controlling the... Um, is controlling what part of the the replay they're at, what perspective they're at, what they're looking at, all that. I don't like having that control outside of my hands because my vods are my vod reviews are um, meticulous and already pre-planned. And having them being able to take things out of my control kind of uh, changes that. I know you can log on to players' accounts. I haven't done that. I don't think I would because I'm not trying to get account shared banned. Good round. Um, and I know that you, there's like you can move yourself from spectator into the game and then back, but I don't know. I would rather just have a player record the VOD if they can. Um, Overwatch League will be viable on YouTube. Will it die out? We'll s I'll just make that super, super quick. I think it'll be n maybe a little bit worse than on Twitch, but there's no like big disadvantage to YouTube, so whatever. Um, what topics should we normally focus on in live scrims or live coaching? Um, <clears throat> I think live coaching... Here's, here's my favorite way to go about it. Before the scrim, or so after like the last scrim that you had, you uh, either like review that scrim, talk about it, just whatever. So that's already set for the next day. And then the next day before that scrim, you talk about what you want to be working on for that scrim. So it's kind of like a recap of your last VOD review of, okay, remember whenever we're uh, getting a kill, we need to start camping that mer that body so Mercy isn't getting reses, whatever. Um, and then that way your live coaching is just talking about what you all talked about before the scrim, if that makes sense. So it's kind of like before the scrim, you're prepping with the, the team, which you all want to work on specifically. And then your live coaching is reiterating on how you all are doing on that. I don't like it 
Kind of the same way where I don't like my VOD reviews being nitpicky and going through the whole thing. I don't want my live coaching uh, as a head coach to be guys are just nitpicking every single thing that the team does wrong because uh, they'll forget all that too. Whereas if you set goals before the scrim and then your live coaching is reiterating how you are doing on that goal, like, okay, today let's practice dive and let's take the high ground, engage without cooldowns, blah, 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 then your live coaching will be about that, and it's easy to stay focused on that specifically. And I think that's something that lower-tier head coaches almost never do, but doing it makes it so easy for your team to stay focused on specific things, and it makes it easy for your team to actually hear what you're saying. Um, I don't think you should be doing any of that like while the map is actually getting played. Like, between rounds is fine, during... Um, like, if it's really, really important, like, it was just something that you never want to see again, you can see it in between fights, but even then, that's rare. Um, but Or, like, between maps, but it shouldn't be mid-fight you saying anything, because no one's going to hear you, and even if they are hearing you, they should be ignoring you. Um, when a coach can apply for a Tier 2 team... When a coach can apply for a Tier 2 team, top 8 OD or more success. You can apply for a Tier 2 team whenever you feel comfortable. Some Tier 2 teams will have um, requirements, like we want you to have other Tier 2 experience, or we want you to do blah, blah, blah. But most of the time, the requ the experience requirement that I see most of the time on Tier 2 teams is Tier 3 t exper tier three experience required, and then that's that. And then the rest from that is seeing how you look on like the application and then just getting your foot in the door and then um, how you actually do on the tryouts. Like when I was like, I don't know. Um, the reason why I actually wanted to do this workshop was because um, Clockwork Vendetta, from what I've seen, has not been getting head coach tryouts um, because there's just a lack of coaches who are able to fulfill duties, even though right now their only requirement for applicants is having tier three experience. That, that's why I wanted to start this workshop, because I didn't feel like there were enough people um, who were confident enough in doing what they needed to do. So there's really not that much requirements other than just having Tier 3 experience. So I would say when you apply for a Tier 2 team, the only requirement that you should have besides Tier 3 experience is making sure that you're ready for it. Don't go into it. Um, okay, Zandy. Shh. <laughs> don't, God damn it. Um, don't, don't limit yourself like, oh, this Tier 2 team has um an opportunity for a trial but um i don't think i'm the best coach in the world so i'm not going to do it when i trial for chicken contendies I i'm going to keep on bringing up this anecdote um when i trialed for chicken contendies they were literally the top of od undefeated and i was on a bottom tier low tier three team but i still trialed for them because i felt that i was comfortable doing that and it kind of felt like a shot in the dark but i ended up getting the spot um that's something where you shouldn't be holding yourself back unless you truly feel you are completely incapable of doing it. So if you have never cut touch, ah, touched coaching before and you see a tier 2 application, maybe hold yourself back. But if you have tier 3 experience and you think you've been improving well, don't be afraid to shoot your shots. Um, I won't do my power rankings of uh, tier, tier 2 contenders teams because they're going to be dog shits, whatever I do. Um, how much should a head coach be about or how much should a head coach be about game knowledge versus leadership or other qualities? What do you mean, Carol? Can you uh, iterate on that? Um. So, I mean, like, how much of a head coach should be, you know, studying up on making sure the game and then, like, pure coaching versus other aspects such as, like, leadership, such as being a person people can talk to and kind of the managerial aspects. <clears throat> and I don't know whether, like, the phrase team dad or something <laughs> along those lines is applicable. But I mean, as opposed to like pure knowledge versus how you apply that and how the team responds to you. I think there is a big mix required. So I think <clears throat> you don't need to focus on all macro if, or especially, you don't need to focus on all macro ever, but especially if um, you have like a strategy coach on you, which I know that isn't super popular in tier three. I know there are some coaches who did like uh, Spillo and Temporal went everywhere together. Um, cause Tempura was the strategy coach and Spillo was the head coach and they just bounced off of each other. Um, Grunto does that right now with Morb and Dance. Dance is the head coach, Morb is the strategy coach. Uh, so even though Morb isn't the head coach, he's still working a lot with the macro. Um, there's a lot of teams that are like that at the higher tiers. Yeah. Rip Temporal. Um, but so like, I, I think if that's the case, you really don't need to focus so heavily on it, but I think it is no matter what important to focus on kind of how you deliver the coaching, how you're an authority figure. Cause you can have 
amazing theory crafting, but if you're one, not practical with it, or two, everyone talks over you and you're afraid to speak up and you don't know how to handle difficult situations, you'll never be a good head coach. I think some of that will come with experience, but I think some of that should also just be something that you're working on, like going out of your way to work on. You shouldn't only look at VODs and learn how to coach or learn what is happening and why and how, but have just absolutely no idea how to apply it or how to speak to your players or whatever. I think that's super, super important. For assistant coaching, you kind of get rid of that a little bit more because you're not coaching the entire team at the same time. Um, But even then there, you need to be an authority figure. You can't just be someone who players can talk down to because they'll just ignore whatever you're coaching. Um, Best way to learn the basics of coaching, such as uh, comp structures, type drills, um, yeah, talking to other coaches, uh, I know, and some coaches will go, no, I'm not telling you anything. Um, I'm a higher tier and I don't want to leak shots, whatever, but almost all the time that I've talked to a coach better than me or with more experience than me, they've been willing to say some things, even if it's not every single thing that I want to hear, they've been able to say some things and, and coaches on my level too are, a- I, if I'm able to talk to them just bounce ideas off of them. Um, like that's the whole point of the server is for people who don't really know every single thing that they should be doing. You can ask people here. Um, a little bit of a a leak here for you all. Um, with promise retiring from owl and overwatch, he does want to have a Q and a here. So we will be hosting one like that. So like just being, being willing to even reach out to higher tier coaches, um, and ask them questions, even if you think it sounds dumb, most of the time they'll be willing to answer. Like, I've never had someone DM me and me just block them or something. Uh, even if I think it's kind of a goofy question sometimes, I'll answer it to the best that I can. Just talking to other coaches and then watching things like um, their analysis videos, VODs like that. So, like, that's more like the coaching side, but then just, like, uh, structure size um, is talking to other coaches and bouncing ideas off of them. Um... Did I cover everyone who asked a question, or did I miss anyone? Okay, Mac, you're muted. If you all have any other questions, don't be afraid to ask. Workshop channel. I accidentally clicked off the channel, and I can't find it again. Okay. Um, And if we don't have any more questions, then what we'll do is I'll cover my VOD review style like I said I would and then we can end it there how much information should I be providing as much as possible or should I streamline the information to them streamline it for sure um always put it in the layman's terms if you can that's always what I try to do you and I said this at the very start but I don't think you are in here architect if you can condense something from three paragraphs to three sentences then do it or three sentences to a sentence, then do it. As long as you're still getting the information across, go ahead. Like you don't want to, you don't want to make it something that's actually complicated that you do need to talk long about into three words. Cause then no one will understand what the fuck you're saying. <clears throat> but like, you don't need to go in, in the middle of a scrim. Hey guys, whatever we're getting a kill, their mercy is flying to their Farah and then staying alive for a little bit and then flying to the, the, the dead body and then reviving them. So we need to start making sure that we're rotating to cover the, like, you don't need to say all that. Just go, guys, when we get a kill, camp the body so mercy can't res. That's going to be way faster for them to hear. And it's going to be way faster for them to understand what you actually mean. Like, when's the last time you sat through a three hour lecture and remembered what the fuck anyone talked about? Cause I never have. Whereas if you, if it's 30, like even just 30 minutes at the tops, if you can streamline it to 30 minutes or less, it's going to be very, very helpful and way easier to understand. Yes. Kiss. Keep it simple. Stupid. Um, yeah. And I, I take that to VOD reviewing. I take that to live coaching. I take that to everything that I can. I even take it to, um, like teaching ideas to other coaches or even just talking to other coaches. Um, I think the least useful type of coach is the coach who will write a 10 page paper talking about absolutely nothing. Um, and that is why, uh, our analysis competition, we had a word limit because yeah, explaining things and putting and writing 20 pages of stuff is sometimes cool and it's cool to look at, but being able to explain everything in as short amount of words as possible and make it actually understandable is a very, very big skill to have. Um, what are the best reflection tools you can provide to players? Uh, what do you mean? Can you iterate on that? 
Um, like whether it be actual like physical resources, maybe um, something else like that, or even just methods. I would just like, for example, uh, like Jane's four death square mm -hmm. uh, thing he uses, something like that, anything along those lines. Um, I almost have them do just what I would do, but I have them do it for themselves. So whereas I would usually watch um, VODs of higher tier gameplay and see what's happening and why and how, um, and then compare that to their gameplay and then bring it to them. If there's someone who wants to do it on their own very often or just someone who needs to do it on their own very often, you can have them do that same thing. Go, hey, I saw this VOD or, I don't know, if you have a Zen player and go, hey, uh, Violet was doing some amazing stuff in this VOD, um, you can watch through it and then just make sure that they're going through it and looking at what's happening, but not just what's happening, but also why and how it's happening. That's the biggest thing um, that I can, like, I cannot stress enough how important that is that you look at why and how, not just what. Because if you're just looking at what, you'll implement it without understanding why you're implementing it or why it works. And then you'll do it in situations where it makes no sense and it'll cause um, uh, mistakes and deaths and all that. Whereas if you're understanding why and how, you can understand uh, how to implement it into your gameplay and why and in what situations and all that. Um, so that, that's usually your job as a, as a coach. If they're someone who wants to go in above and beyond and do that on their own, you can teach them how to do that too. Um, and that'll be something that they can do in their own free time. And then you can, what you'll be doing then with VOD reviews with them is kind of bouncing ideas off of each other. Uh, whereas they'll have, they'll see something and they'll explain why and how for, and their reasoning. And then you'll see something you can explain why and how your reasoning. And you can kind of come to an agreement or uh, <clears throat> already agree on it to begin with. Or see why you all have differences in your thinking and see how you all can apply those ideas differently. Do you, if that makes sense. Yeah, that definitely does. Thank you. Um, Carol, go ahead. On this server, I hear a lot about how people call certain tier three coaches trash. Or they say a lot of coaches in. You might yeah, just gonna, like, okay. yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna. So yeah, people in this server call a lot of tier three coaches trash. I want to know, kind of why and what things those coaches do that makes people like I don't know Mac, for example, consider them trash. Uh, are we saying Mac is trash? Because if that's the case, then I agree. No, no, no. Oh, I'm no, saying no, like no, Mac no. calls people trash. Why? All right, well, I think Mac's trash. So. Hey. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think a lot of the reasoning behind it is, <clears throat> some of it's kind of lighthearted not i mean like even if you think someone is bad calling them trash is a better way of saying this person is fucking awful never talk to them never have them on your team whatever um <clears throat> but i think a lot of the time even if it's something that shouldn't be said it's coming from a place of <clears throat> mistakes in their coaching so kind of going back to common things like either i know a lot of coaches that i don't like specifically even if i don't mind them as a person it's because they're way too over wordy or theoretical Whereas they don't have a lot of practical coaching, they'll type 20 pages of stuff for no reason. Um, some of it is being disorganized or unconfident, inconfident, I don't know what the word is. Um, and then that kind of contributes to weaker coaching. I think there's a lot of flaws. I think in the end, no one should be hard judging coaches unless other coaches, unless it's um, situations where like that coach has gone out of their way to be a bad person. Like, trying to kick uh, players from a roster uh, for no reason, cough, cough, um, or things like that. I think there's, I think it's fair to disagree with other coaches, um, and a lot of times it'll come from their mistakes, but <clears throat> that's probably the bigger reason why. I don't think you should, you should see someone, uh, <clears throat> listen to one person call someone trash and then go, okay, that person's garbage, I'm going to shit talk them too. <laughs> Mac, that was not what I was talking about, but I hate you for bringing that up. Um, I forgot what I was saying now. But yeah, that, it, it probably comes from just mistakes and disagreements in their coaching style. Um, sometimes it's just a matter of opinion. Sometimes it's a matter of they're a scumbag and they are trying to kind of get them to not make the same mistake as working with them. Um, but I feel like that's probably the main reasons why. Um, any suggestion for young players? Um, I'm a young coach. I started coaching at 14. Uh, I was in contenders at 15. I am now 16. Um, I have coached young players. The best thing that I can say is make sure they are managing their time well and make sure that they are, um, being respectful and grinding it out in scrims. I, like, I feel like a lot of players fall into that trap of, I'm young, so I have to be immature. 
Um, and then they get, uh, I'm not the youngest player. I'm the youngest coach. Actually, I don't think I'm even the youngest coach. Um, they fall into that trap of I'm young, so I have to be immature. Um, and I think making sure that they don't fall into that is a big, like I've worked with literal 12 or 13 year olds who are more, more mature than 17 and 18 year olds just cause they know what they want, even though they're young. And I'm not saying every 12 or 13 year old will be like that. Cause I've met some equally childish 14 year olds. Um, I won't say any names, um, but I think some NA people may know who I'm talking about. Um, <clears throat> yeah, go ahead and add something. All right. I have a flex support, 13 years old, I guess. And I told him, like, they have a diva, like, you need to use your barrage sneakily. Be sneaky, all right? And he flanked all the way back. He was like Invisible Somra. We didn't have him in the fight. So for this is my observation. I don't know if you will agree with me. For a young player, if you want to give a feedback, you need to express what you really want to see, like, deeply. Otherwise, they will do something, like, like this. Like, he flanked all the way back as far as, like, ground for us. And we failed that fight. <laughs> yeah, I could I could see that, um, of players being hard at, young players being hard asses and taking it... <clears throat> much farther than uh what was clearly expressed i think the best thing you can do there is just be very firm in your uh in your expectations of what you want them to be doing um and worst comes to worst if they're it always comes down to give them the boot if they're not willing to listen to anything um I haven't had to do that with players, although I have had players who are kind of hard asses like that or are kind of immature because of their age um I think in the end. If they are in that higher tier, remind them of their goals. Like, Sugar Free doesn't act like a fucking child, like a literal 10-year-old, because he's an academy and he has OWL goals. Or if not OWL goals, if something changes with OWL by the time he's eligible, at least other eSport goals. Because, like, I'm sure he's been reminded of that before. That's why when I was 14 or 15, I wasn't fucking shit-talking as a coach. I, was, I even knew to watch my tongue as a coach, watch the things that I say. Because I knew I had my goals of where I wanted to go. Um, <clears throat> that's always something that you can remind players of if they do have those goals. And if they don't have those goals and they're being hard asses, give them the boots. That's the best I can say. Like, if players don't have aspirations and they don't have a reason to be dedicated, you can't force them onto them. And you can't force them to listen. Um, do we have any other questions? <laughs> yeah, just boot your whole... Yeah, I don't see the problem. Just get a whole new team. Uh, I, I think there's, I think there's a lot of things you can do before having to reach the boot. I'm just saying that's always the last case scenario. Like there's never a player who is immune. There's never a player where they, you have to go, oh, he's so good or he's so amazing or whatever. We just can't touch him. Um, there's always going to be opportunities to one, try and fix their problems, try and get them to fix their own problems or at the very, very end, if all else fails, give them the boots but i don't th i don't think that should ever be your first option unless it's just like extreme extreme toxicity i've had to deal with players like that before go ahead architect hey man um should you like set boundaries with your players that you're coaching like as to not get too friendly with them and such i think i don't think you should set boundaries on them i think you should set boundaries on yourself so i agree that the a coach should always be an authority figure and i've had coaches who are not coaches i've had players who i'm very close with um Kashir Khan, if you're in A, uh, Tanner, if you're in A, I don't know any EU players, I don't know if I'm saying if you're in A, um, <clears throat> but I've had players who I've liked a lot and I've gotten friendly with, but I've always made sure that when it comes down to coach time, I'm a coach first, I'm not their friend first. Um, the same way where you have a, co a, a teacher in school, you can have a teacher who you're cool with or who you're close with, but when they're teaching, you're never going to go and disrupt a lesson or um, if you're the teacher, disrupt a lesson to talk to them or whatever. Like you're a teacher first in that situation. So I think it's important for you to set that boundary on yourself rather than them. Like I don't think you should ever go to your player. Dude, stop DMing me. I'm your coach, not your friend. I think you should um, kind of set that boundary on your own. I don't think it's bad to be friendly with players outside of coaching time. Like uh, I've had game nights with my players. I've DMed my players joking with them. But when it comes down to the important times, VOD reviews or mid scrim or whatever, um, you need to make sure that you are that authority figure. And I think that's even more important if you're on the younger side like I was. Um, when I was 15, 
I was always like my players didn't even know I was 15 until like three or four months into coaching them because I made sure that I was set as an authority figure before I was set as a, a friendly figure. And I think that's something very, very important for coaches to do. Um, what do you think of teams requiring players to do a certain amount of ranks per week? I think that's stupid. Um, <clears throat> well, here, I think it's stupid under certain conditions. If it's a player who very clearly is not improving fast enough in scrims um, and you need them to do even more, then getting them into ranked is important. I've had players like that where they'll play in scrims, but then outside of scrims, they literally don't touch comp ever, but they're not doing enough in scrims to make that suitable or to make that okay. Then you want those players playing comp. But if it's a situation where your players are in scrims and they're playing well in scrims and they're trying hard in scrims and they're improving in scrims, you don't need to force them to play comp. Um, I've had plenty of players who only touch scrims besides like training rain or like a uh, custom modes, like aim training shit. Um, and they'll only touch scrims besides that. But I let them do that because they're trying hard in scrims and they're doing what they need to be doing in scrims and they're playing well in scrims. Um, I don't think you should. And I've also had players who show up to scrims and they're, they play in scrims, but they don't do enough. And then they refuse to play in comp, and then that's a major issue. I don't so much like a required amount of hours, but I, I think if it's a situation where they're not doing enough in scrims, you should push them towards playing comp. Even if it's something where it's like, dude, why am I playing comp? It's nothing like scrims, whatever. You can always improve yourself mechanically and on your own at that level. Um, Carol, what do you mean call out who? Huh? No, I'm chatting shit to a guy I coach. Don't worry. Oh, understandable. Uh should you be 4K to coach 4K? Um, <laughs> no, never. I started coaching when I was, like, plat, dude. I think I was coaching contenders when I was plat. I was plat or diamond. I don't remember what. Um, I think you should definitely have an understanding of the game, and that should be based on yourself. Um, like, I, if you're a bronze player, due to, like, mechanics and understanding, maybe you shouldn't be coaching GMs. But if there's, um, like, if you just don't play enough comp or if you just um, have a really shit PC build, um, sorry, I, was, I just got distracted, um, that shouldn't hold you back from coaching as long as you have an understanding. Because, like, you can, you can break down scrims and VODs and teach those things to players without being a player. Um, and I've seen plenty of players who transition to being a coach and then fail, even though they've had just as much experience as their players who they're coaching. Um, that's why not all basketball coaches played in the NBA. Sure. Some of them do, but not all of them. You don't have to be an NBA player to coach in the NBA. You don't have to be a 4k player to coach 4k. You just need to make sure that you can understand and explain things to 4k players. Um, like I said, I was in platter diamond while I was coaching contenders. Those are 4.6k player, 4.5k, 4.6k players. And I was 2000 a thousand sr below them but they would still listen to what i was saying because i made sure to explain everything i wasn't just pulling it out of my ass and saying well it works in comp because obviously i wouldn't fucking know from there um so yeah i don't think you should hold an sr limitation to you and i i think if there's a team having an sr limitation avoid them like the plague because they're usually teams that are inexperienced and don't understand that you don't need to have high sr to be a good coach which means they usually won't be worth your time anyways um, how does it feel to coach for Grunto again? Is running back an old team awkward or do you find it comfortable? Well, Mac, for your information, um, I wasn't on Grunto when it was Grunto. Uh, it is kind of weird to join the org that your old team kind of transitioned into, but I think in the end, it's just coaching a team again. Um, I kind of forget that Chicken Contendies transitioned into Grunto for a while. I, I don't know. It's just coaching a team. You get over it, even if you do end up remembering it. Um, I think if it was the same uh, management team and same players, it'd be a little weird, sure. But I think it would. I think it would still be fine because I would just take what I have learned um, between joining different teams and improve my coaching even more. Um, I barely picked a master. Yeah, yeah. I I've only just peaked masters now, and that was way after I was done with coaching contenders. Um, I just played some comp for a while and hit masters. Like it's really not that important what your SR is. I mean, as long as you're not like subbing for your team or something, that, that'd be weird. <laughs> um, thoughts on running new composition, new style of contenders. I have no fucking idea. I I'm so out of the loop with new contenders. Um, 
I yeah, I agree it is more risky, but I just I, I don't feel like I'm educated enough to comment on it. Um, what do you think of guest coaching? Do you think there's a benefit of splitting up coaching from your main team and visiting teams instead of a broader pro I don't really like guest coaching unless it's a lower tier team. So I think it's fine to do <clears throat> guest coaching if it's like you're maybe a low 4K team or below and you're getting um, experience from someone who is like a known high tier three coach or contenders coach or whatever. Like Natter does guest coaching for way lower tier teams. Uh, I know I think Solheim used to uh, mm -hmm. just stuff like that. Um, Natter really is everywhere. I think that's fine. But I think if you're like a team that's actually competing in tier three, guest coaching is kind of weird. I think it would, rather than getting guest coaching in that situation, I think it'd be better to get a high tier coach to talk to your coaches directly rather than coach your team, like do it on their own for like one or two games or whatever, have them help your coaches. And that way they don't have to be there for your team to run the same. Then your coaches can run it with that little extra experience behind them. If that makes sense. Like I know, um, get amazed, uh, of third impact does some guest coaching. I think, at, uh, not like the super low 4K level, but like medium 4K, I think. Um, and I don't think that's bad, but I was just I was just thinking if that situation happened to me, I wouldn't want him coaching my players directly. I'd want him to teach me things, and then that way I can teach that to my players. And then that way it's still coming from the same authority figure, and it's still going to be there even if that guest coach leaves, if that makes sense. But I think, I think below a truly competitive level, guest coaching is fine. Yeah. Um... Any more questions? Um, I don't mind doing guest coaching myself. Um, it just also depends on is it a lower tier team. So I probably, I probably wouldn't even guest coach for a team that um is about the same tier as me unless it was like interim coaching rather than guest coaching where I'm only doing it until they get a, a new coach or whatever because they're looking for someone. Um, I've done guest coaching before for lower tier teams and I think it's sometimes fun to do and I think it's fun to reach out to coaches who are asking for help. Um, but I don't think... And, and I, it does kind of help fill in time whenever, like if you're LFT, if you don't have anything to be doing, that can help fill in the time and keep you... Um, warmed up and not rusty, but I don't think it's something that you should be spending all your time doing. I think it is a good way to kind of get your name out there like Natter did, but I don't think it's, it should be a focus. What do you look for, for an assistant coach? Um, hmm. someone who can, well, I'm, I'm an assistant coach. So this is a weird question. <laughs> um, when I was a head coach, it's, I've, I've done both. I've done assistant coaching and head coaching. When I was a head coach, I looked for people who were practical. Um, I didn't want a ton of theory crafters. I wanted people who uh, could look for solutions and apply those solutions. I wanted for people who were uh, short and concise, so not people who would do hour-long VOD reviews. I was looking for people who did VOD reviews in my style, which is 10 to 30 minutes, one or two topics. Um, I was looking for people who I knew would get involved, so not people who I thought would be afraid and would just not talk to the players. I was looking for people specifically who I knew would be willing to um, talk to the players, get involved, coach the players, like people who just weren't afraid, people who were confident. Um, I almost never cared about experience, actually. I, I trial people who were Tier 4, um, even if they had a little bit less on the... Um, how do you put it? Like the uh, exactly what I was looking for. Like if they were a little bit, a little less practical, because I knew I'd be able to teach those people how to be practical. Um, so I wasn't looking for like the perfect coach every single time that we would look for a coach. I look for a select few things, and if they were missing something, I would be willing to uh, cover in for that. So like if they weren't confident, I would try to assure them, make sure they were confident. If they weren't super practical, I would try to get them to be more practical, less theorycraft. Now, if they were every single one of those, uh, if they weren't any of those things, then I wouldn't be trialing them. That's kind of just the things to be looking out for. But I think my, my, um, how do I put it? My requirements for what I was looking for are pretty much the same as what a tier two team would be looking for from my experience. So that might be, that might be more, uh, more demanding than a tier three team, but I think that should be what you're striving for to begin with. Um, leading on that, how would you teach them to be more practical? Um, kind of like what I did in my notes. I don't know if you were here cog for that, but teach them rather than just taking notes or just noting what's happening notes. Um, 
how you would actually improve that and then get them to actually do that. So rather than looking for theoretical solutions to things or no solutions at all, whenever they see a problem, look for the solution to that problem and then get them to think about how they would actually go about solving that problem. Um, yeah. It wouldn't just be... Sorry, I'm, tr I'm trying to think of the words in my head while I talk. It wouldn't just be, okay, go out and do this. It'd be, okay, so what's the problem that you see? Okay, how would you fix that? Okay, now go out and actually fix it. And that should be something that they can pick up pick up on pretty quickly. It, it shouldn't be something that takes a long time to do. It might be so sort of weird to start for people who are new into the scenes because it's not always required, even though I think it should be. But I think that's something that is pretty easy to do. So I think if you have someone who just can only do theory crafting, maybe you don't need them as a dedicated coach. I don't know. Hmm. Questions? Any tips for goal setting and scrims, uh, as well as making sure players keep in mind how to quantify it afterwards, uh, see if they achieved or not, to what degree. Um, set the goals before the scrim. Always set it before the scrim. So I set it... Um, what, so like if you need to have a meeting 30 minutes beforehand, an hour beforehand, whatever, go ahead and do that. But make sure it is well and known what the goals are and then make sure that they are um, practical goals. So this isn't practical so much as solvable, but practical as things that actually make sense. Like you don't need to teach them have a goal of like, OK, today we're going to do. Um, I, I can't even think of like a real and practical one, but like you want to set smaller goals that are achievable that can build up into large accomplishments, if that makes sense. Like, um, let's work on... Wait, which which of Zandy's questions? She only asked one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I kind of went over it pretty quickly. Um, I think it should be uh, smaller goals built into kind of bigger ones over time. So, like, okay, let's make sure that we take that rotation that we talked about in yesterday's VOD review on this map... If you need to do map-specific goals, make sure you're saying them before the map. If you just want to do scrim-specific goals, say them before the scrim. Like, hey, we've been letting every single Mercy in every single game um, get to uh, get too many reses. Let's start camping bodies this game. And then what you can do is after the scrim, just at, like you can ask them if you feel like they achieved it. And then if there's kind of no consistency, watch through the VODs and check with them. Um, that's kind of more nitpicky, but you can kind of skim through that just looking for the specific goals. Like if you're just trying to get your team to do one set rotation for that scrim, look at uh, after that scrim, go through the VOD, look at the rotation, see how it was done, see what you can improve. Just small incremental goals that turn into big things. You don't want to set a super, super big goal like have 18 rotations to memorize on King's Row because they'll forget almost all of them. Start with like a few of them and then you can build on top of that. Um, uh, so if you want to get started coaching, you think it's best to start as an assistant? I'd say probably um, you, could, you can start as a head coach. It's not bad to start as a head coach but I think it's good to start as an assistant coach so that you can see where other head coaches are coming from and how they do things and then talk to other coaches while you're an assistant coach don't just listen to the one head coach that you have because if they're saying something wrong then everything that you're basing yourself off of is going to be wrong so just uh start as an assistant coach is my preference you don't have to um but just make sure that you're talking to coaches and knowing what you need to improve on um excellency I've never suggested um a book or a movie but I have suggested like hype songs to players like before scrims or before matches. If I know we've been low energy lately, um, I go try to get them hyped up, play a song, let them play whatever song they want to play. Just get thing, get them into the right mindset to get motivated. And I don't know about like long term. Um, that's a good point. And we uh, there's a Gatorade commercial that I liked a lot that I actually pinned to the channel talking about how you want to make a rival because that rival will push you to be better. When um, Inked got beat by citizens, I showed them that video and we based a lot of our scrims off of that video of we want to come back and beat citizens the next time we play them. Um, so not so much like books or movies um, for the long term. But I have recommended, like, songs or things to get them motivated for, like, the short term, like, just for today's scrim or whatever. Um, Jaxie, go ahead and type yours. And then, Mac, go ahead and ask yours and voice that at the same time. Oh, I, I was just going to say you should definitely play I Am The Champion over and over again before every game in OD if you want to get top placement. All right. uh, that's, that's all I'm going to say. Um, absolutely don't do that. 
Um, okay. As a high school student myself, I've had some difficulty in time management. Are you involved in a lot of things? How do you manage your time? Jaxie, I honestly have no fucking idea how I do it, and it was why I retired the first time. Um, you kind of have to limit one what you do, but also limit your procrastination, which is really fucking hard to do. So when I was coaching, um, before I retired, I was doing pretty much only sport or not sports, um, coaching and like the minimal effort in school. Like I was taking advanced classes, but nothing that was too hard. Um, I was pretty uh, able to breeze through those things. And then I retired because on top of school, I picked up more AP classes. I picked up two sports. I picked up a girlfriend, Pepe laugh. Um, and just all these things. And it felt really, really hard to do. I still have those things. I have no idea how I'm doing it now. Honestly. Um, I think it just comes down to literally having no downtime. You cannot be procrastinating. If you're going to hang out with friends, you go hang out with friends. But the second that you're back, there's no procrastinating. Um, if you know, you have work like homework to do or schoolwork to do before scrims, that shit needs to be done. Uh, that's like the only way that you can balance it. And then like, it, it makes your schedule way more intense. Um, but there's people who have jobs on top of scrims, on top of school. It's like, if you really want it, you'll find the way to management. And it might come with some sleepless nights. And it might come with some insomnia. Uh, that's me. I get no sleep. But um, in the end, if you want it, you'll cut down on the procrastination. You'll cut down on things that aren't super, super necessary. Um, and then you'll find some time for it, even if you have to make some sacrifices. Um... Yeah, retiring while 15 years old. Omega lol. Uh, <laughs> Jesus Christ. I was too young. <laughs> uh, any other questions? I'm just going to fucking say it because I can't be asked to type it out. You mentioned about the, um, I think it was being brief in VOD reviews. Mm-hmm. So, uh, if no one else is going to ask questions, then there's that. All right. Yeah. If we don't have any questions, I'll cover that then and then we'll end it. So if you all have questions, you better line them up right now. Cause it's, it's almost, it's almost been two hours now. We'll end this pretty soon. So we'll get our, if there's any last questions, go ahead and type them. Otherwise I'll cover how I do my VOD reviews. Cause people still be wanting to cover that at the end. All right. I don't see anyone typing. God damn it. <laughs> Actually never ends, dude. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how some of you all have sat through this whole thing. I'm not going to lie. Oh, okay. Yeah, I did say I would cover this at the end. Um, the What do you mean the biggest step is in the biggest difference? People just like scared to talk. Rather than like, just like typing everything out every time, man. Dude, some people are Holy antisocial. Shit. The coaches and the antisocial, okay. Yeah, yeah, Please, okay, no okay, don't bring just, up that just point. Just putting it out there, good God, fucking luck. God damn it. Um, yeah, so, the biggest difference. Tier 3, the Tier 3 team that I was on, um, and then moving into Chicken Contendies, which eventually went in the Contenders. Um, I had to get a lot more practical. I honestly credit Spillo with so much of, like, my coaching style. He got me from being a lot of theory crafting to a lot of practical shit and a lot of long nitpicking VOD reviews to going, hey, maybe don't do that. Let's focus on one or two things at a time, short, all that. Um, so I think pretty much the, the yeah, literal boxing madman. Um, the, the biggest differences were making sure all your solutions were practical and that you would actually see effects from your coaching rather than just talking out of your ass and um, hoping that it actually does something to your players is a lot more uh, actually finding solutions to their problems and then seeing that effect in the scrims. And then a lot of being short and concise with it as an assistant coach rather than longer nitpicking things. Um, there was a lot more scrimming, obviously. Um, but I think those are things that are kind of expected. I think it's not so much harder, just as more um, experienced, really. Like, it wasn't hard going from theory crafting to practical. It wasn't hard going from long VOD reviews to short ones. It was just more so um, getting more experience and getting more professional with it, which I don't think, which, which is why I don't think anyone should be afraid to take the jump from tier three to tier two. Because even if you end up falling out of tier two, you've, you'll have learned so much that you'll actually be successful in once in for, for, ah, for once in tier three. Um,. I can't think of a good question because I'm just trying to take all this information and good round. Um, 
All right, I'm going to cover this VOD or er, my VOD review style then, which you all can credits below for. Um, I've covered parts of it already throughout the whole thing, but the main thing I do it is uh, I ask for the VOD way beforehand. I don't want this VOD 10 minutes before I'm reviewing with the player because I will not be able to look through that in time. What I will do is I'll look through the VOD looking for patterns of misplays or mistakes. Um... And I won't, I, you don't have to sit through the whole two hours doing it. You can obviously skip through maps. You can skip through some fights. You can skip through while they're setting up for fights, unless it's something like specifically pre-fight planning, pre-fight positioning, all that. Just know ahead of time what you want to look out for. And then set like a range of things like, okay, maybe I want, I, maybe I know this player is liking on their mechanics. I want to look at some of their mechanical flaws. And then from looking at their mechanical flaws, you realize, oh, he consistently over spams right click without putting out discord or whatever the fuck. Um, then you can start looking for specifically that pattern throughout the whole VOD. Um, so what you start doing is you start looking for examples of that repeated mistake over and over and over until you know that this is definitely a problem that they're, they've repeated doing. Um, and then from there. You want to find a solution to this problem. You don't just want to point out a problem with your VOD reviews because that's fucking useless. What, what's the point of you being a coach if you're just pointing out a problem? A player can point out their own problems if they don't know the solution to it. Um, if you don't know the solution to that problem, you go study it in VODs. But if you do, assuming you do know the solution, um, you, the, you then cover the solution to the problem and how that solution would, one, be applied and how it would actually affect their gameplay. Um, and then you just show them examples throughout the VOD. You don't need to show them the whole VOD, which is why it should only be 10 to 30 minutes. You pick out examples ahead of time of what you want to cover, that mistake, show them the mistake, show them the solution and how it would be applied, and then show them the difference. Um, so it ends up looking like I get the VOD maybe an, uh, an hour ahead of time at the least. I don't have to spend that whole hour looking through the VOD, especially if I know ahead of time. Like, I've seen them in scrims, and I see from scrims, I know what I want to talk about. I'll just ask for the VOD, and then I'll only use the VOD for examples. Um, and you don't have to look at every map, and you don't have to look at every fight. I've done things where I fully only look at not, not even just one full map, just a few fights on a map. But I make sure that I have other examples of it ahead of time, because... Uh, and this kind of depends on trust, like the player actually trusting that you're doing your work to make sure that it is repeated and not just one fight. Because if they don't trust you, then that like four fights isn't going to be good enough for them. Um, but I make sure that it's repeated and I have other examples ahead of time and I'll show them only a few examples. And I'll tell them that these get repeated throughout the whole VOD. So I'm not going to spend two, uh, two hours talking about the same mistake through the whole VOD. I'll show you 15 minutes of examples. And you have to trust me that that goes throughout the whole thing. And if they need to show up, um, oh, John's here. Hello. Um, uh, you, you, where was I? You want to show them those examples. And if you need to go and if they don't believe you and you need to go and show them more examples, just make sure you have those ahead of time. Um, and then with those examples, show them the solutions, apply those solutions, uh, and show how it would be different. So like my latest VOD review was with my... Africa, I'll just tell you all was with my main thing. Um, it was maybe 10 or 15 minutes, but it was because we were only looking at one problem. Um, and that one problem was how are they using their Arisa pools? It was, they were using them, I felt, incorrectly. I felt they weren't getting enough value from their Arisa pools. So for that 10 or 15 minutes, I looked through about like five or six examples of their Arisa pools. I explained why they were bad and why they weren't working or why they weren't getting value or why they could be getting more value. Then I explained how to actually do that. Like instead of placing them here, place them here. Instead of using them like this, use them like that, whatever. Um, and then I showed them how, if they would have done that, so this will include some good examples of what they've done or other players if you can't find any of them. I showed them examples of when they did it how I'm explaining how it actually worked out well. So, like, for example, if I thought they were using Orb, or not Orb, uh, Holt too much just for the sake of slowing enemies rather than actually getting value by getting out poke, like, with the rest of their team, I go, see, look, right here, you pulled this person, and yeah, you stopped them from moving for 0.5 seconds, but you got absolutely nothing out of it. Whereas here, in this fight, you pulled them above the shield, and you called it beforehand, and your team spammed them, and you will get a free pick off of that. Um, it's just small things like that, and you don't need to do that for six mistakes, or six um, different patterns for every VOD review. That could be, like, one or two things. Three at the most, if they're all, like, kind of small things, and you know the player is capable of holding, uh, handling them all. But it shouldn't be a full-on lecture about what you want to fix. 
um, the easiest that I've ever learned in school is when a teacher uh, teaches me what I need to know and then shows me examples and then just lets me go. I don't need to be sitting there for two hours hearing them talk about the same thing, if that makes sense. Um, if it's a player, and th this might not work with all players, if it is a player where you know they need to go more in depth, go ahead and go. Don't be afraid to uh, flex for your players, but that's how I run my things. I keep them short, one or two topics uh, based on uh, a few amount of examples and then solutions to them and how they're applicable and everything. If you have any questions about that, don't be afraid to ask. If we don't have any questions, we might just end this because it's been uh, exactly two hours. <laughs> All right, I'm calling that then.